Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm Paul Davies, director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science. And welcome to one of our special annual lectures in uh, honor of Eugene Shoemaker, uh, here you, you see a picture, uh, who pioneered the subject of asteroid and comet impacts with, uh, with the Earth and with other planets. And as far as I know, is the only human being whose ashes have gone to the moon. Uh, now, uh, before I introduce uh, the speaker who will give tonight's uh, Shoemaker Lecture, uh, it's my honor and pleasure uh, to introduce someone who knew Gene over many decades. Uh, now, you may know that ASU has one of the world's largest, possibly the largest, meteorite collection. And the founding director of this uh, wonderful Center for Meteorite Studies is Emeritus Regents Professor Carlton Moore, who is with us this evening. And he's kindly agreed to uh, talk for a short period about his, uh, uh, the life and times of Gene Shoemaker. And then after that, uh, I will introduce tonight's speaker. And already he's given me a little present. This is a, a piece from the uh, uh, Arizona's famous uh, meteor crater. So uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Carlton, can I? Uh, uh, turn the microphone over to you. You'll come to me. And he actually literally carries meteorites around here in, in his wheelchair. He sort of hands them out <laughs> left, left and right. Yes, they said I could talk for a couple of minutes about Gene. It's rather frightening. I knew him for over 50 years, and I can and you can look online and see his history and his story and the things he's done, including the fact that his ashes went to the moon. And, um, but I thought maybe I would talk a couple of things about things he did with ASU which may be uh, not on the list that he has there. I think I first met him in 1964 when the Meteorite Center hosted the annual meeting of the Meteoritical Society here in Tempe. And uh, I have a funny memory of him. It's funny that I should remember that because I remember him walking across Palm Walk over here with a little wooden box with a handle on it and what was in the box were his glass slides. Back then, they didn't even use 35 millimeter slides for talks. They had uh, large glass slides, and uh, many, many students here never have seen such a thing. But in any event, I remember him coming to uh, give the talk with his glass slides. This was after he had moved to Arizona and um, founded the uh, astrobiology uh, facility in Flagstaff and had finished doing his thesis work on Meteor Crater. I think it's rather funny, speaking of moving, a, being a citizen of Arizona, if you read Gene's history, he was born in California. He went to elementary school in Buffalo, New York, and spent the summer in Wyoming. Now there's a combination for you, there's not many people who would do things like that. But in any event, he moved to Arizona, founded the Astrobiology Institute, used this as the mechanism to study, keep studying Meteor Crater, and train the astronauts there. In his uh, list, they also mention he had a place near uh, Sunset Crater where they trained the astronauts. That's gone now, but I had the privilege of of going in there, and what they did was they built a, with a bulldozer, a model of a certain part of the moon, and they marched the astronauts around. Now, Gene really wanted to go to the moon, and so he used to get in the astronaut suit. The only problem, I remember one time in the summer, the suits on the Earth were not air-conditioned, and he uh, collapsed because the he was so hot inside the suit, but maybe that was a, a warning to the astronauts, too. After uh, 
he did his work at the crater, and uh, we got to know each other here at ASU. ASU published a guidebook for his to the crater, and this includes uh, some physical uh, geology by Sue Kiefer, and then the astronaut uh, trail and the maps of Meteor Crater and things like that. This thing got so popular that we had to reprint it a few years ago, and I don't know if the Meteorite Center has any, any more like that. Marching along, uh, the Meteorite Center had a national uh, advisory committee, and for many, many years, a wonderful physicist named AOC Near, maybe some of you know if you're in mass spectroscopy business, uh, was the chairman, and then when he died in an auto accident, Gene took over and was in, uh, in charge of our committee. And uh, always had good ideas of things we should do, and he never ran out of ideas of things we should do. I might mention at the tail end, someone reported a little crater up near Chin Li on the Navajo Reservation. And uh, he and David Roddy went up and studied it and turned out that this uh, crater, little crater, was used as a garbage dump. And they measured the physical geology of the crater and then sent the materials from the crater to me to do chemical analysis. Needless to say, although I was a co-author on the first successful amino acid paper published from meteorites, we didn't try to measure amino acids in the garbage dump because it's probably pretty full of them. In any event, uh, I think knowing Gene, whenever we did anything, his mind was always a thousand miles away two weeks on the next problem he's working. So if he gave this talk, he would say, um, we passed the little crater on the Navajo Reservation. It's time to move on and hear about the big crater that we're going to hear tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Carlton. Thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, take, take a moment to draw attention to my t-shirt. Resplendent in my Beyond Center t-shirt. So, uh, we can sell you one if you uh, are so minded. Uh, anyway, let's, uh, let me move on to introduce tonight's uh, speaker, uh, Sean Gulick. Uh, now, he's a marine geophysicist, and that means he actually goes to sea uh, on ships and other structures that sort of drill down. And he's going to talk about that. Um, and did you say that you'd spent a total of three years at sea overall? So that's an awful lot of seasickness, I guess. Um, uh, but uh, uh, in particular for tonight's lecture, he's going to be talking about the Chishulub impact crater. I hope you will admire my knowledge of the Mayan language. Uh, this is, uh, as he will tell you, this is uh, in what is present-day Mexico and, uh, and the Caribbean. Uh, he, his study is uh, plate tectonics and tectonic climate interactions. Uh, he started out in North Carolina, then he did his PhD at Lehigh University, and he's now at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, and he's been there for 18 years, and it would be remiss of me to leave it there because he also has an international reputation for his prowess at jousting. Uh, he, re he, he travels the world uh, with, with his lance and his horse, I think they probably get provided, uh, and... Um, and they charge at each other and try to kill each other. Uh, and uh, it's, I'm pleased he's still alive and able to give uh, the uh, 2017 Shoemaker Lecture this evening. So, Sean, over to you. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, it also explains why the black eye is not from a bar brawl, but <laughs> a little practice accident. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk to you tonight about an expedition that was 
17 years in the making, I guess. Uh, you could maybe argue it was even longer than that, which was um, to attempt to actually take samples from the center of the only meteorite impact structure that we have on Earth that we um, know is completely preserved from a, a large impact perspective. It's the only one that's linked to a mass extinction event, um, obviously famous for the death of the dinosaurs and, and uh, arguably the most important event in the last hundred million years. And also, um, the only one really accessible because of its preservation for us to think about the role of impacts in life, both the negative side, the extinction side, but also the positive side, whether or not they can be viewed as habitats, for instance. Um, the things that are here on the, on the screen, uh, the icons, if you will, are all the ways that this ultimately ended up happening after uh, uh, 17 years of drilling proposals, um, because we ended up getting the funding from something called the International Ocean Discovery Program, uh, which is the, uh, the, the sort of follow-on programs to the deep sea drilling project, the ocean drilling program, the integrated ocean dr drilling program, and so on. And this is the latest generation of these. Um, and we got some co-funding from the International Continental Drilling, whoa, come back, International Continental Drilling Project here. Um, and it was managed and, and, and operated by a European consortium that, that, that got us on our way. And I'll show you the drilling platform and so on when we did this work. Across the bottom are the rest of our partners, so the Yucatan government, the Yucatan science agencies in Mexico, um, a, a lab in Houston that, that provided us some very inexpensive uh, CT scanning, and then a software company in Austin, famous for the scientific Python uh, uh, conference they put on every year, who did all the processing on the images for us for free. Um, so why should we care about impacts? Um, well, you could argue it from both ends of the timeline, if you will. You could argue it because the beginning part of our solar system had an enormous amount of, of things flying around in space, crashing into each other, including the moon forming event, for instance. Um, and the scars of those events are easily visible in, in the planetary surfaces. Um, and so there's this period here, say the late heavy bombardment phase, where many of the craters, for instance, on the moon uh, were formed. Um, on Earth, it's interesting because this was happening here too. And we look at the oldest rocks and discover that they're right about the time frame that the late heavy bombardment period stopped 3.8 billion years ago. We also discover plate tectonics started somewhere in a similar time frame, and life on Earth started somewhere in a similar time frame, which begs some interesting questions that are unanswered about the linkages between these processes, resurfacing of planets by impacts, plate tectonics starting up on Earth, and how life gets going. Now, fast forward today. Um, this picture on the right, every dot on it is a near-Earth object. This is actually from a few years back now, uh, so this should be even more dots. Our orbit is the light blue orbit, and you can see that there are a significant number of things still flying around in space. And so understanding impacts as a process um, is, is, is probably important to think about even today, um, as the wonderful meteorite exhibit upstairs uh, can tell you. Now, um, how we came about to thinking about a particular extinction event on Earth uh, being related to one of these impact strikes goes back to this uh, uh, location in Italy, Gubbio, Italy, where uh, a father-son team, the Alvarezes, Walter and Louis Alvarez. Louis Alvarez was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Walter Alvarez was a geologist at Berkeley. Um, we're asking a really simple question, which was how long did it take for this little clay layer, um, which lies in between these layers of rocks here to the bottom, which were from the Cretaceous era before 66 million years ago, and the rocks above it, which were the time after. How long did it take for that little teeny clay layer to deposit? Um, and so they thought they would perhaps look at it with something that doesn't change a lot through time, which is just the flux of cosmogenic radiation. And when they measured this little layer, just to figure out how long that might take, instead of finding some sort of constant amount of flux which would allow them to maybe figure out how quickly the layer deposited, they instead found a spike. Um, a spike in iridium, 80 times background, and said, well, gee, this is, a, this is obviously not what we were looking for. It's a wonderful surprise result. And the only way you can get a spike of that much iridium is if it actually was brought directly all at once, say, in an asteroid or a comet. 
Um, and thus was born this idea of um, there being a linkage between the end of the Cretaceous and the mass extinction event that happened then um, and some kind of asteroid or comet hitting the planet. And in one of those wonderful coincidences of science, so that was published in, in 1980, um, Jan Schmidt, down in the bottom right there, was also looking at a layer in Tunisia, sent the samples from that layer off to a lab, and the lab said, we're sorry you've contaminated your samples somehow. We don't know what's wrong with it, but it can't be right. These samples are wrong. And so he didn't get to publish the paper. The Alvarez got to publish the paper. It was a couple of years later before he got to, he realized, of course, uh, the contamination was signal, not contamination. It's always important to know this. Now, fast forward 30 years later, our science party that drilled the crater this year was 32 scientists. Jan Schmidt, uh, a professor emeritus, got to join us, which is pretty great. So still got to have his time enjoying it. OK. So how do we know about this, this event? Well, we, we knew that there was this iridium anomaly. As you go to these, these rock sections around the world where you see the end of the Cretaceous age rocks and the beginning of the Paleogene rocks, um, you find these clay layers with iridium. But as you get closer to the Gulf of Mexico, instead of finding some thin little boundary, you start finding more and more complicated boundaries right between these, these sandwich layers of time. Um, so, for instance, as you get into actual northern Mexico and in, into the, the basin uh, near the Yucatan, you actually start to see very high energy deposits, things like that might have been caused by tsunamis or big slumps coming off of slopes and so on. And so already there was this idea that the crater that caused this had to be somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico region. Um, and it turned out it actually um, had been discovered back in the 60s by... Uh, oil prospectors um, from Pemex, but they didn't know what they had. And so that wasn't revisited until the 90s, and I'll show you a picture of how they figured it out in a minute. But I do want to show you one example section from the oceans, because I'm going to talk a lot about the impacts, effects on the oceans, because the impact crater was a marine crater, and where we drilled was also ocean afterwards. So the organisms we can actually see in our cores are all ocean organisms, um, which are key. So here's an example from the southeastern United States, from the Blake Ridge. Um, and what you see on the very bottom um, are foraminifera, so they're, think of them as zooplankton, animals of the, of the upper ocean, um, that were living at the end of the Cretaceous. Is that a point? Oh, great, thanks. Right there, right? Yeah, these guys. Um, and just above them, you see the, the sort of expanded version of this boundary section. What we see on the bottom are little spherules, little tectites, little glass balls that fell out of the atmosphere. And as you move up through it, we'll actually find minerals from the crater that are shocked by very high pressures. And at the very top, we actually find dust and ash and soot and, of course, the iridium layer. So this is the sort of boundary, if you will. And then right after it, we see this enormous difference in the life living in the oceans. Um, we actually lose a lot of these large body sizes. We actually have a change in diversity. Um, only four of these guys survive, and only two of them go on to evolve into anything else. Our entire world's zooplankton are evolved from two species that made it, which is pretty interesting. Okay, so this is uh, now the Yucatan here. This is approximately the size of, I guess you'd say, the inner ring of the crater. This is how it was discovered, um, is by potential fields data, by gravity and by magnetics. This is a, a gravity map showing um, horizontally enhanced, so it easily shows the sort of ring-like structures that were down there. When it was drilled by the oil company, they ran into the crazy-looking melted rocks, thought they hit a volcano, and said, there's no oil here, went home, and it was kind of forgotten about for 30 years. Um, and then in 1991, they, these maps were rediscovered when they were looking for the crater, and the first paper was published in Geology saying, this is, in fact, the, the impact crater. Um, and here's a, a nice image uh, in geophysics, uh, the kind of images I like to make, um, showing the, the local geology, which you'll see is some very bright looking, these are reflections from the sound energy we send down, um, which are actually from evaporated ocean layers. So they're anhydrite and gypsum are the kind of rocks that are made up of them. They're, they're, they're from having evaporated the oceans. And you can see them as almost nice little markers until you get to the crater, and you see them dropping down in as these sort of dropped in blocks. right? And then interestingly enough, um, there's this lump sitting here near the center of the crater, and it turns out it's actually a ring. This is known as a peak ring. It's only present in the largest of impact structures, 
And so when it was discovered, we were like, wow, we have this very large crater that is completely pristine. It actually still has this ring that we, we've never found anywhere else on Earth. And therefore, we have this opportunity that we could drill into it and learn something fundamental about how impact craters actually work. And while we're at it, we're drilling on a high. So hopefully, we don't have a lot of disturbance. And we could actually watch life come back at ground zero. And that would be pretty exciting. So it's, it's, uh, these are two of the main reasons to go after this. So what's the theory of what exactly happened? Well, we think now, based on the models, that it was a 14-kilometer diameter asteroid, about nine uh, miles in diameter, um, that struck, and actually it should say 66 million, the latest dating, that struck um, the Yucatan. Um, it was a shallow sea between about 100 meters and maybe two kilometers deep. Um, and somehow, it caused 75% of life on the planet to go extinct. Interestingly enough, greater percentages occurred in the surface ocean. Uh, in many cases, 90, 95% of surface ocean species went extinct, but only like 5% in the rivers, which is, so there's some very big difference in ecosystem re relationships and in body size. Anything bigger than about 60 pounds went extinct. Smaller guys made it. Um, so these are some of the, the ones that we, we lost in this process, obviously the big dinosaurs, and you'll notice that I've now put images of what they really looked like. They weren't drab, green dinosaurs. They were, they were very colorful things with feathers and fur that dinosaurs are more like our birds. Um, and in fact, the avian ones, many of them did survive. So some of the dinosaurs made it through um, as, as our modern day birds. Um, in the marine realm, there were very large marine reptiles that had the same kind of niche of the ecosystems as these guys did. They all went extinct, and so did you know, these interesting creatures like these. Um, and again, as I mentioned, something like all but four of the plankton species, the forams, went extinct. The survivors of this, amongst them, included some ancestors of ours. Um, and if you fast forward 66 million years, you get to a science party. And this is really useful because now we can go drill the crater. I should point out one of the science party members is uh, Axel Whitman, who is not here tonight because they just had a baby yesterday. And, uh, but he's here at Arizona State, and he was selected for being a member of the science party. Um, so this is uh, where we chose to drill. Again, right here in this lumpy thing called a peak ring in the center of the crater. Um, and this is a map where we show, think of this as density, if you will. It's velocity uh, of sound waves through the rocks. But you can also think of it as density. And I want you to notice that this big mass is almost featureless. Whatever it's made of is actually fairly low density material and doesn't seem to change very much. And in fact, it's actually lower density material than, than you know, even some of the limestones that filled the crater just, just next to it. So we have no idea what it is until we drill it. Um, and it has some very strange, even lower density material parked up on top of it. We were very interested to find out what this is and, of course, what made it. So we asked three basic questions. One is, how in the world do you cause a large impact to weaken the rocks enough to, to go from a bowl-shaped feature like Meteor Crater into these big, wide, flat things that large impacts look like. And what makes up the peak ring at all? And can we use this to understand the way impact craters work? Second is, what caused the mass extinction? Can we study you know, the rocks that are recovered here and the recovery of life at ground zero to understand the mass extinction event and how quickly life recovered after it? And can we use that to think about sort of current stresses on the environment, perhaps, and think about how quickly life might change or come back from those. And then, what effect does a large impact have on the, the Earth that it, it leaves behind or the planet that it leaves behind? Is it creating, if you will, niches for life? We know it has a huge amount of energy. Lots of fluids are going to flow through this thing afterwards. Is this a good place for life to catch a foothold, like microbial life living in the subsurface? And if so, can we think about this as a potential way to have life get going on Earth. That would be an interesting outcome. So I'm going to explain each one of these in a little bit more detail before I show you the results. Um, there are, this is uh, the Schrodinger crater uh, on the moon. It's a peak ring crater, like Chicxulub. You can kind of get these, see these lumpy things. It's colored in density effectively based on the gravity data. And what you see are the blues saying that even though these things are mountains, they're actually pretty low density. And then you can see it stepping up away from the crater. So how in the world is this made? Well, there's two different models that were in existence uh, a year ago um, before we drilled. 
Um, one is that it, it is a melt-driven system. So it hits, it makes a huge amount of melt, moves things out of the way, makes this big giant pile of melt, and then as there tries to be a little bit of a rebound from the crust below, it kind of gets stopped by this massive pile of melt. And in this model, this is going up and squishing things out to the side. Things are collapsing into the side, bumping into the melt, and the, the ring here, this thing, the peak ring, would be made of the stuff that came in from the side. So in Chicxulub, you would expect it to be made of maybe the evaporites, maybe the limestones that are Cretaceous in age, kind of sliding in and bumping up to make a ring of mountains. So that would be one predictor. Alternatively, the computer modeling based on nuclear codes says instead what happens when you hit these things is you hit them so hard that it temporarily causes all the cohesion or the strength of the target to go away. And they temporarily behave like a liquid. So you get a bowl and then you get a big rebound upwards and an outward collapse of it and you get some melt piled up in the middle but the peak ring in this case, this ring of mountains, would be made of material that came from really deep and flipped up in the air and came back down again and in this case the peak ring at Chicxulub should be made of whatever is below the limestone. Something super deep that was in the crust, maybe middle crust even, 10 kilometers down or something, um, if this model is correct. So obviously that's a cool testable hypothesis, the kind of thing you like to put in proposals. Um, next question is the mass extinction event. Well, we know that it was a hell of a day in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a map in thickness here. So this is up to, say, a, a thousand feet thick, if you will, of all the stuff that fell downhill that day from the earthquakes that were set forward. Magnitude 10, magnitude 11, depending who you, who you uh, agree with. Um, there was also an enormous tsunami that followed. There would have been a blast radius out to about this distance. It would have incinerated anything in the area. Right? So it was really bad locally, but why did it kill things on the other side of the planet? You know, why did it kill 90, 95% of the surface oceans? That requires something else, something atmospheric um, to, to understand. This is the, the sort of data, if you will, in a, in a, in a, in a graphical form you know, of all the organisms that made it through the Cretaceous and were suddenly snuffed out, the few that made it across, and then the evolution that came after. And if you measure global productivity, either by uh, carbon isotopes or just the weight percent of calcite on the planet, um, either way, there's this enormous crash and then a, a rebuild. Um, this is the iridium spike at the exact same time, and the volcanism from the Deccan Traps was started before and continued after. And there was one nearby, but there doesn't seem to be any connection to the volcanism in India, because there's not even a local extinction event related to it, until you have this particular event tied to the iridium. So we think this is a pretty case closed, that the impact did the damage, but then the questions are how and why. We have these wonderful examples. This is from El Kef in Tunisia, where you can see 30,000 years after the impact, the very first new foram evolves. Um, but you can see all these organisms that made it through. We call them disaster species, the ones that really, really like living in really stressed environments. And then we can see it took maybe millions of years before that evolution really took off, and we have a very diverse system again. But why? Some ideas are out there. We call them killing mechanisms or kill mechanisms. Um, maybe the surface was heated up by the stuff ejected from the crater coming back in. Maybe it's the darkness caused by everything put up into the atmosphere, nuclear winter type scenario. Maybe it's acidification of the ocean. It was a, a limestone target, so there's carbon in there. So CO2 can go back into the ocean and acidify the ocean. Um, that, that's an interesting wrinkle. Maybe there's enough metal in the meteor to actually poison the surface oceans. So there's some tests we can do at the crater. We can test for how bad the ocean was after the, after the impact. We can look if, if recovery is impaired when you're close to the crater. Is the recovery better or farther away? Um, and we can hopefully find out some of the extinction mechanisms. And here's a little model showing um, Europe getting hit by the ejecta as an example of this idea that it's this incoming ejecta that heats up the surface of the Earth. So these are... Uh, particles arriving from Chicxulub 6,000 kilometers away to Europe. They're kind of parked at the top of the stratosphere here, if you will, or bottom of the stratosphere. Um, and the heavier particles kind of rain down potentially pretty quickly within that day, within a few weeks anyway. Uh, and the light ones may stay up there for as much as three years. Um, and that would certainly cause a scenario with very little sunlight making it to the surface if this idea is correct, 
But it depends on what's in there. It, is there sulfur making sulfate aerosols, CO2, dust? What is in this thing that, that really allows us to test that question? OK, so the third thing is this idea that maybe impacts can, can create a place for life. Um, and this idea has been around for a little while. This is a model of a peak ring on Mars, in early Mars, with the idea that they, peak rings would be wonderful places for fluids to flow through. And this is a plot from Chesapeake Crater. Chesapeake Bay has a crater below it, impact crater, 35 million years old. And this is just a, a raw account of cells in the crater rocks. So as you go down to a, a kilometer or so, you can see the limit of life in the rocks. Drops off, gets really, really low, and then boom, it jumps back up again when they hit a block from within the crater. So there's actually an ecosystem today, this is living cells, living down inside the impact crater that's healthier than the rocks just up above. And so one explanation for this is that the crater kicked off a microbial ecosystem because of all the fluids in it, and then evolution took over. And even when you took the fluids away, there's some residue ecosystem living at 1,500 meters down, you know, almost you know, 5,000 feet down in the subsurface. And do we have such a thing at Chicxulub? So what did we do to test this? Um, well, we went to Progreso, Mexico here. This whole thing is the crater right here. The ring of cenotes, the water-filled sinkholes that line the crater live right here. And people do silly things like swim between them. This is the longest pier in the world because it's a super, super flat shelf. It's a six-mile long pier just to get to like 20 feet of water. Um, and so we went out there and picked up a lift boat and went offshore by about 25 kilometers um, and drilled for two months. So this is the lift boat up in the air, uh, about 50 feet up in the air. Um, and what we put on it was a land rig, a mining rig, that spins very fast but doesn't put a lot of weight on bits. So it goes really slowly. It turned out it was great for, for covering the rocks. This is how we had to get on it in a, in a basket affectionately known by the Mexicans as the Widowmaker, um, which I thought was really fun. My co-chief thought was terrifying, entertaining. Um, and so we did this for two months. We drilled the crater. Uh, um, and then the rocks that we recovered were then sent to Germany, to Bremen, Germany, where they were split and described for another month, where people meticulously went through and sampled and described them and so on. And I'm going to show you some of the results uh, from both of those things. In between being offshore and the looking onshore, the full cores went to Houston and went through a medical CT scanner with two different energies, allowing us to measure density and atomic number, um, as well as get really nice images of the cores. OK, so here's what we got. We, cored starting, we, we started pulling core out of the ground, rocks out of the ground at 500 meters. We just drilled ahead for the first 500. And then we cored until we ran out of money. Um, so we spent our 10 million right there at 1,334.7 meters, basically. So we could have gone to 1,500, but we almost got there. And this is our cartoonized version of what we drilled. Now I'm going to walk our way down through the rocks and try to answer all the questions we just talked about. Um, this was published in Science in November. Um, and the big thing is we actually do have significant rocks from within the peak ring. So we'll talk about exactly what those are. So the first thing we hit were limestones of different types, marl stones, clay stones, so on. These turned out to be from the Eocene, from a really hot time in the Earth, um, starting about 48 million years ago. And we went through wacky stones, grain stones, pack stones, red stones, all this kind of stuff. Very exciting. All the way down to about 52 um, million years. And then we actually saw two different zones of black shales. That's pretty exciting, actually. One of these is known as the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, the highest CO2 time um, in, in the last 60 million years or so, um, where the oceans went anoxic and died. And this is the, 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 the benthic parts, the base of the oceans. And this is what this is recording. So that's useful for studying for an entirely different reason. And then about 10 meters later in, in, in drilling, another 30 feet or so, um, we actually hit this funny looking layer here, which I'm going to call the transition layer. Um, and we could see all kinds of funny features in it. And then right below it, the rocks changed to what looked like sandstone. This is a picture of it. So that's the interesting transition layer. I'll come back to what that is in a minute. Notice the dark layers here and the dark layers at the top. We'll revisit those. This is a zoom in at the bottom of the core. You can see these dark layers. And then notice the dipping looking stuff here. And this is the CT image of it. Looks kind of like a sandstone dune or something. 
Well, this is on top of a high, 600 meters uh, in the middle of the crater, 600 meter high in the middle of the crater. And so you need to put high energies there in a marine environment. Best way to do that would be to bring a tsunami back into the crater. So this, this turns out to be the very top of the, of the impact layer, if you will. And it's recording high energies even at 600 meters up, which means that the tsunami that deposited this had to be on the order of 600 meters high. So 2,000 foot tsunami. Pretty exciting. Below that, the rocks got really weird. We started seeing all these black dots are impact glass of one form or another. So that makes all of these rocks what is known as suavite, which is a rock formed by an impact. Um, and you could see as we went down deeper and deeper and deeper, they got larger and larger clasts. The limestone class, these gray things here, are from the Cretaceous. So these things were around at the time of the dinosaurs. Um, and we started seeing fragments of actually broken melt. So the green is melt from carbonate, from, uh, from limestone, basically. The black is melt, mostly made of silica. And the green actually flowed over the black and ripped it up and made this crazy looking rock. So it's a super dynamic environment, which is really interesting. Now we can see this also in the CT, and in general we see the same thing where these things are getting bigger and bigger class as we go. And when we get right to the very bottom of it, we actually start hitting more proper crater melt. And if you looked at the images of it, while it might look almost featureless, you could see chunks of rock kind of almost digested inside the melt from the target. It was pretty interesting. So that's this. The next thing we went into is the actual melt sheet proper. And it looks really wild. So again, this is the green carbonate melt and the black silica melt. And they can't mix. They're immiscible. So they swirl together in a texture called Schlieren. Makes some really beautiful rocks. be a wonderful countertop. Um, except for it's all fractured. Um, and below that, we hit what the peak ring is actually made of. This is our core wall right when we were describing it. Here's that melt, 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 and boom. What is that? kind of orangey looking stuff. Well, it's granite. Just pure, simple, pink granite, like from a lot of other places on the planet. So it is not made of limestone from the side. It is made from granite, which turns out to have come from about 10 kilometers down. So one of those models is definitely right, and the other model is definitely wrong. Um, this is also showing, because this is CT data, that it's all fractured. Everything is broken and fractured. So these rocks really went through the ringer. Here's a nice little 3D image I think. Yeah, of the melt and the granite. And you can see how many holes are in this thing, how, much, how fractured it is. So this granite is super distressed. One way we measure how distressed the granite is is by measuring its physical properties. Things like its density and its porosity, how much pore space, you know, how many little holes are basically within it. And granite. So here's, you know, this is kind of what you'd expect, right? The porosity goes down with depth. The density goes up with depth because of all the stuff piled up on top of it. We hit these suavites, this breccia stuff, and you can see it drops in density like you wouldn't believe, and the porosity goes through the roof. 30 or 40%. That means a third of the, those melted rocks are actually air, right? They're, which is pretty remarkable to think about. And then we hit the granites. Normally, granite has maybe 1% pores. This is like 10%. So these are the lightest picking up granites you've ever felt. And some of them are so weak that you could just crush them in your hands. So it's nothing like a granite should look, despite the fact they look correct. They, they don't look funny at all. So the route that they've taken to go from 10 kilometers down to get to the surface of the Earth at the time obviously damaged them significantly. So this is then taking this sort of picture and mapping it back to the geophysical images. And you can see these super bright looking things here are actually mapping right at the top of the impact uh, of, of the peak ring are actually mapping this zone of melted and broken up rock. And so now we can map that around the crater. The other things we see as we move down um, is we actually see that the size of the chunks in there are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And we see a really bizarre spot, which I'm going to zoom in because it's hard to see, which is this is that low density section here. And we see an even lower messy section right here, right before we go into the melt, which has got us interested in what exactly happened right at the beginning of we went from melt 
to this pile of, of messy, broken rock, and there's something really funny about the base of it. And what we think that something that's really funny is, is that if we measure, you can ignore the rest of this for the moment, if you measure how angular or rounded the rocks are moving down through all these broken things, you can find a zone where the rocks are much more rounded. And so one thought is that's when the ocean first came back in. So we're only about 10 meters above the melt in terms of stuff. So maybe that's all fallen down the hill and moved across the crater, and then the ocean comes right back in. The ocean may have come back in within potentially 10 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, something like that, and rounded a bunch of these really large clasts enough um, to kind of make this anomalous layer within the base. And then after that, the ocean is there. It's present. But there's probably still tsunamis moving back and forth constantly, all the way up until the grain size drops to just sand size at the very top of that layer. And this is how the ocean got back in. Um, this crater is not perfect. This is a, an image that kind of goes in a circle around the edge of the crater. So you can see around this part of the crater, it's, it's really shallow, right? Um, as you go to over here, you can see it drops off and gets deeper. There was actually a slope at the time of the impact, and therefore there's actually no rim to the crater on this side. So right after the, right after the impact happened, we made a crater with a hole in it, to the northeast, right to where the Atlantic Gulf of Mexico is, um, and the water could kind of rush right back in again and fill the crater up very quickly. Okay, let's move further down in. I talked about the granite. Here's a couple of pictures of the granite. Um, you can see how fractured looking it is in some sense, how it's got these funny bands of dark minerals um, running through it. So this, this granite is, uh, has got some really interesting textures. Um, and if you look at it in detail, what you find is it's actually damaged at every scale you could possibly imagine. You can see things like hairline fractures here. You can see things that where it almost looks folded. You can see things where the fractures have actually melted, potentially. Um, and the rock is actually almost turned to powder by moving past itself, this cataclysmic kind of, 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 of structure. So super deformed rocks. And we find actual faults, even at the core scale, with symbols of motion in both directions on them. So if you actually ran your fingers along to figure out which way that fault moved, you'd discover it actually moved both ways. So these things are actually broken, shattered, and then moving like this as they're going up in the air and back down again. So they're damaged at a, at a remarkable scale. And they're shocked. I don't know if anybody's seen one of these before, but this is a shatter cone. Shatter cones only occur um, at gigapascals or pressure or higher. This one one this size, you know, the estimate might be something like eight gigapascals. We find them within uh, dikes within the granite that were already there before. So the shock wave passed through it and caused basically a series of runaway earthquakes, if you will, running through this, where it kind of breaks, causes more earthquakes, with them break, causes more earthquakes, and it kind of causes this fractal pattern almost of, of shattered energy moving through the dike. And if you look under a microscope, you find every mineral in there is damaged by high pressures. So you things like fractured plagioclases, biotites that are kinked, the, the fault, this cataclysis, even at the, at the thin section scale, if you will. And then the, the big one here are lots and lots of planes of deformation in each quartz grain. Um, this many planes in this many overlapping directions gives you something like 20 gigapascals of pressure. Um, and of course, to melt rock, which we have melt rock, takes about 60 gigapascals of pressure. Now that's a hard number to think about, so 9.7 million PSI. Is that better? No? I don't know. It's really hard to think in, in numbers that, that high, but it's an incredible amount of pressure to actually do this, this damage to the rock. What's amazing is, of course, it does that. It travels all the way up and back down as a mountain and still looks like granite, but it's fundamentally deformed and changed. Now at the very bottom, we actually found something pretty important, this little blue patch down here is actually a big thick zone of really messed up looking suavite. Again, this melted, brecciated rocks, just like we saw above, except for here, the, the rocks within it, none of them are from up above. In fact, there are kinds of rocks in here we didn't see anywhere else in the core. Things like gneisses and schists and quartzites and myelinites, things that came from somewhere else in the basement with a 600 meter pile of granite on top. 
So one way to view that would be it's like a big fault. That this thing goes up, and as it comes down, it kind of runs up a fault. This is actually the fault. It's 80 meters thick, a couple hundred feet, right, of all kinds of rocks it picks up along the way and transports this giant block of shattered, fractured, shocked granite into, into place to make a mountain. And the time scale of that, based on the models, is about 10 minutes. So it is consistent with a model that looks like this. This is also tracking the peak pressures here of the rocks that will end up in the peak ring to show that this model's physics are coming up with approximately the same pressures that we record at the crystal demographic scale in the rocks. This is the collapsing in incoming you know, limestones to the side, and this is that you know, rising upwards. I'll play it for you one more time because it's fun. It's rising upwards. Go back. There we go. Rebounding because everything's acting like a liquid. Collapsing outwards. It's starting probably to become a little more brittle as it comes down, starting to fault and break. And this plane right here might actually involve a bunch of big faults to actually put the granite in place there. So that's a, our model of how we think the peak ring forms, and it's obviously consistent with one of the two models presented with the computer models from the nuclear codes, not the other model. Now, what did we learn about extinction? Um, so this layer, 80 centimeters thick, turned out to be really important. In it, we find the survivors um, that, that made it through, things like these are the, the grass of the sea, the nanoplanktons. Um, and then we signed... Um, right at the very top of this layer, the very first new 4M. So this is 30,000 years later, right there. But this section here, we think was deposited in only about three years. Um, and we, part of that is that we can see burrowing at the top. So there were actually organisms living on the seafloor within just a few years of the impact, um, certainly before 30,000. So life came back to the crater remarkably fast, would be one answer. The other interesting thing is we actually find both at the bottom here and at the top evidence of metals. So right here, those dark bands appear to have evidence of iron, chromium, nickel, and so on. And we think that those are actually deposited um, by that first rain of particles coming back down to the atmosphere and ending up on top of the tsunami layers. At the very top, we also see very, very fine examples of these. So this may be that three years later when the fine stuff falls out of the atmosphere. So it does imply an atmospheric component um, to this. And very critically, when we look at all the rocks in the pile of swavites and ask, what are they made of? We cannot find a single gypsum or a single anhydrite anywhere in it. So none of those evaporated ocean sediments are somehow preserved in the crater. An explanation for that is that the pressure caused those to vaporize more than the others. And so we had a huge amount of sulfur, which is what's in those rocks, go into the atmosphere, and the sulfur dioxide potentially helped block the sun. The other thing we think we know happened was fires, because we found charcoal, both a spike here at the bottom and a spike here at the top. And here's a picture of the charcoal fragments actually in the core. So we had the burnt forests coming back in by the tsunamis and being recorded within it. Okay, and last but not least, um, we also found evidence of life in the crater. So we actually see um, cell counts as we move down into these swavites that spike. So there's actually existing, um, uh, you know, cells living within it. And we've pulled out some DNA from three different ones in here, so we hope to find out what they live. And we found evidence of hydrothermal, very hot springs that occupied the crater for at least 300,000 years after the impact. So having said all that, you always have to allow for alternative hypotheses. So I'll leave you with that, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sean, um, so much for that uh, presentation. Uh, I neglected to say at the outset that this uh, project has attracted the attention of no less than five, or is it six, uh, film crews, and uh, a series of documentaries, one of which has already appeared on the BBC and uh, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, and there's a NOVA special, 
uh, on Seven. December 27th. So be sure to see that and uh, you'll get some better idea of what it's like to live and work on uh, this rig here. Uh, it didn't look too bad, I have to say. I think it, probably seasickness was not a problem. No, we were le rather above the ocean. Right, yeah. right. Um, but but you don't go in hurricane season, I guess. No, we, that's right. We were in April and May on purpose. Yeah, yeah. yeah it yeah. was the hottest time of the year, but the hurricanes were the least. Right. So. Now, it's a tradition uh, for the Shoemaker Lectures that we present the speaker with a little trophy, and sitting on top of this trophy is a piece of glassy material. That's called an impactite, uh, and it's very appropriate uh, for a lecture about impacts because this was made in the Libyan desert by uh, uh, an object uh, smashed into the, into the sand and fused it into that sort of glassy structure there. So it's my great pleasure, pleasure to present this to Sean uh, in uh, memory of today's Shoemaker Lecture. So Thank there you. we are. And uh, w we can now, now move to question time. Yep. And uh, we have some roving microphones and some roving young ladies to bring them to you. Uh, and so uh, we're going to let uh, Sean do his own moderation. Uh, so uh, over to you. Hi, um, I had a question. Were you able to do, um, deduce where or the, the angle of impact yeah, and uh, then the subsequent, uh, I guess, uh, debris that went out after? Yeah. yeah. So I didn't, uh, I didn't talk about it um, in this because uh, it was packed enough as it was. Um, but uh, when you do the recreation of um, the positioning of the deep part of the crater, where we look at where the, where the center lies um, relative to, to how the, the surficial features are lying, um, it turns out that a 3D model would suggest a direction. And Gareth Collins um, is about to put in a paper on this. The direction was, uh, we think, west-northwest, roughly, in orientation. Um, and it was uh, at about 60 degrees. Um, and so, in fact, that's interesting, too, because now we can do a better calculation than talk uh, Natasha Artemidova has done this about how much of the target vaporizes once you get that angle down. So you can think about that input. And so the next step is for us to estimate how much anhydrite and gypsum were there and then couple it with that model to say how much do we think was actually released. And then people can run their atmospheric models and say how important was that or not. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, to, have you looked at any possibility of dark matter being involved in... <laughs> No, <laughs> I guess I'll just say that. Yeah, no, I haven't. I'm not even sure how you would. More questions? Thank you so much. Yep, okay. I'll leave some pictures of course up. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Can you say a little bit more about the iridium story? About the iridium. Iridium, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's actually, um, so we actually don't yet have the results from the crater about whether or not we have uh, the iridium in the crater, but we are testing it. We have sent samples from right here. So this is that 80 centimeters that probably took three years to deposit. This is the top of the tsunami layer that probably took a day to deposit, right? And then this is 30,000 years, and then time slows down a whole lot, right? Because uh, that's geology. Um, right here, there's an interesting set of layers that had some nickel enrichment and so on, and right down here, right? So we have two candidate spots, and so we have taken samples from each place and sent it to four labs around the world to very carefully test not just iridium, but all the platinum group elements, um, osmium and, and so on, and see if uh, we do get a chondritic signature. Um, the initial results suggest that we do have one, but it's not yet done. And the interesting thing is, if, if, you know, if it's here, this takes, this would have to have come in back by a tsunami, right? This would just have to rain in and happen to land back in the spot it came from, which it would do that everywhere. Oh, it's just part of the impactor. So if you're, if you're in an asteroid, 
um, and you're not protected by an atmosphere, you're constantly getting bombarded by cosmogenic radiation and the, the, the quantities of the platinum group elements in there from the radiation plus just the raw number of metals that are in there, that combination results in way more than we ever see on, on Earth. Uh, yes, if the crater is anywhere near the blue hole. So actually, the I will show you something really quickly. So, go back to this for a second. I, I mentioned briefly the cenotes, but I didn't actually show you. See, these white dots, every one of these white dots is a water-filled sinkhole called a cenote locally. They're tourist attractions. The Mayas uh, viewed them as sacred and sacrificed people in them, or turtles, or both. <laughs> um, and uh, they happen to line the crater. They are only about 10,000 years old. The reason they're there lining the crater is these faults, right? So when water pours on the surface, the water happens to, the rain over 10,000 years, happens to find the faults down here and make caves. Most of the caves are at about 80 to 100 meters down. Um, and those then align along the faults, which are ring-shaped, and they created a network of caves that are all filled with water um, that now nicely line the crater for us. So the only surficial thing you could see if you go to Mexico is these Holocene 10,000-year-old features, um, but they are, in fact, aligned along faults made by the impact 66 million years ago. Yeah, this is the land part. And if you go right here, there's a national park because the water comes out and bubbles to the surface. Up there. If, um, sorry, if you could go back, um, what next things would you be interested in oh, trying to do? Great question. Um, well, I would, now that we know that we have a really interesting record of recovery of life right up here at the top, I might be interested in drilling over here where it's much thicker and see if you can have an expanded record of how life came back to the crater. That would be really useful information. Or go to the middle, where you can see this, this kind of look, bright looking thing right below the center of the crater. That's actually the top of the impact melt sheet. So instead of getting the little thin bit that's on the top here, we can actually drill into the proper melt sheet and find out uh, what, what, what that's like. So those, either of those would be really interesting uh, targets if we could go back. I just need another 10 million each. <laughs> Does your data tell you anything about the composition of the asteroid? Yeah, so um, actually the, the tektites that have been observed from it around the world um, in various boundary sections from end Cretaceous rocks, um, those have actually been studied for a number of years. And there was a, probably about five or six papers in the mid-90s which came to the conclusion that it was a carbonaceous chondrite. Um, and I think that's still going to be consistent with the same things we, we have now. Excellent question. So we asked if there are any data from the Pemex core drilling. There are a series of drill sites onshore, including an international continental drilling project, a few Pemex cores here, and then some um, National University of Mexico cores were all drilled. Now, the problem with drilling on land is they didn't have this, right? This is only available in the offshore where we could shoot our seismic data with our ships and actually see the, see the target. Onshore, they were basically drilling on the, on the picture from gravity and magnetics and hoping to get interesting stuff. So they did get a bit of the melt sheet in a core drilled in 1958, right? Um, which of, there's basically nothing left of it. Um, they did, uh, they never hit the peak ring in any of the cores. They did drill in some areas within the sort of trough, if you will, and one area right at the edge, which was the, the ICDP core, where they basically drilled one of these blocks that's slumping down into the crater. Um, that actually was quite useful because that block turned out to be made of 30% anhydrite and gypsum. So one third of the target in that block was actually made of evaporated ocean. And of course in our core, in the center, none of it. So that means it, it's gone, which is useful. Um, and, and so all of them have some helpful pieces of information that now we can go back and probably understand a little bit better because we know exactly where we drilled this time. Yeah. Um, it, it is all contracted by whoever does the operation, in this case, European Consortium for Ocean Research Drilling. Our drillers were actually DOSEC um, from Utah, the U.S. company. In the back. Uh, 
Yeah, there. To create all these visualizations, I'm assuming it takes a tremendous amount of data and processing. Do you have like an idea, can you give us an idea of how much data you processed and how long that took? Wow, yeah, good question. Uh, uh, yeah, so there's actually several pieces to that. The first is before you ever drill, you have to make images of what you drill, right? And these were uh, shot in 1996 and then in 2005. Um, and there's something like 2,000 kilometers of seismic lines over the crater, um, each one taking you know, I guess you would probably say weeks of processing per line, you know, uh, and significant computer power to get all the, the nice images. And then the more recent uh, high-end stuff as far as um, the operational component goes are the CT scans, um, which are my um, The amount of data just in scanning 800 meters of core turns out to be uh, about five terabytes of data. So if I show one of these, you know, cool images. So this took um, weeks of scanning and then months of processing and five terabytes of images because we can see down to 0.3 millimeters in three dimensions in every bit of our core, um, which is a, a pretty useful. So there, there's a lot of processing in that as well. And then there's a lot of eyeballs on microscopes. That's the other bit. Can, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, you didn't tell us how fast the asteroid was moving when it struck. I didn't. Um, yeah, so the know. estimate, the 60 degree estimate um, and the 200 kilometer nominal size of the, the impactor you know, going out to the sort of the middle of the rings, mm -hmm. um, that combines to say about 18 kilometers per second. Right. right. What, so what's that in megatons 40, then? Uh, put this into context. How many have Russian mob bombs? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of energy release, can we, how do we, how do we wrap our heads around this? 10 billion, right, right. Yeah, 10 billion. That's, uh, that's a big bang. Yeah, it's yeah. a large. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the, you didn't like the 9.7 million PSI. That uh, was, gonna go to 10 and, billion Hiroshima. And I'm trying to visualize the tsunamis, <laughs> you know, what if, if anyone was around at the time observing this. 2,000 uh, foot tsunami. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, the, on, the, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, or uh, what? Well, it would have crossed the, all the oceans. Yes, yeah. yes. But in the, we don't know exactly their runoff height everywhere. We just happen to know in the crater right. when it came back in, right. that's how tall it was. Are there, is there any evidence from any of the other continents of, you know, rocks so, swept up? Absolutely. Onto... In fact, one of the best ones is in northern Mexico. There's a phenomenal place in La Popa Basin, which has tsunamis that came in and went around a mountain and deposited way back in there. That's a pretty awesome place. And right near where um, I live in Texas, in the Brazos River at the time was a shallow seaway, and it actually there's a tsunami exposed in the uh, layer exposed in the river. So that's you know a thousand kilometers inland, or you know, hundred kilometers or so inland at the time. That mm -hmm. uh, would have been a shallow seaway. And just last year, Jan Schmidt, who I just mentioned before, has been studying this for decades, um, found uh, spherules, those little particles, in uh, fish bellies in Montana. So they think he, they were, they were hit, caught in a seiche, and they had eaten some spherules, and they had happened to die by processes within days or weeks or whatever of the event. Um, and that's in Montana. So the tsunamis went all the way up the shallow seaway that covered the center of the United States to reach at least that far. Right, right. So um, the, the Hollywood productions were maybe n not so far of the mark. No, in some ways they weren't. Just this whole flying up and drilling into a, a meteor, though, that's that's bunk. No, no, that, <laughs> that, not that, not that one. Yeah, the other, yeah, the yeah, other one. The other one I thought was not so bad. No. I didn't mean to hijack the Q and A, but we should limit it to maybe a couple more questions. So, uh, could we hang on? Hang on. Yeah. Great. I believe you said there was more. There was more life left in the freshwater streams than in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. And it's true. why would that be? So, well, yeah, it's a great question. I, I'll give you my personal answer. I'm not a biologist, but it, just thinking about the various processes. So you can think about lots of life that's driven by the primary producers. The sun, I mean, there's no grass at the time. There wasn't grass until tens of millions of years later. But think of the ocean, plankton is the grass, right? When you cut out the food source from the sun, then everything that eats it and everything that eats that and everything that eats that has got a problem. Right? You, you can crash your food web in a, in a pretty significant way. A lot of things that live in oceans are actually dependent on flow of material moving down, and they're, they're either carrion eaters or they're, they're eating what bit of algae they can find or whatever. And there's a lot of organisms that can actually 
live with a lower metabolism. So, for instance, crocodiles made it. That's always interesting. Why did crocodiles make it? You know, maybe their capability of metabolism is actually a key thing. Sharks made it. You know, why did sharks make it? Maybe, maybe a similar answer. So I personally think the rivers were less affected in part because their ecosystem isn't, is immediately dependent on, on you know, the primary producers like the oceans and like the land animals. For that, you know. So maybe the last question now. I uh, don't know how we choose. Yeah, right you there. choose. She's got a microphone. So she'll okay. Did you tell us the size of the asteroid? Uh, the size of the asteroid, yeah. So it's about uh, 14, 12 to 14 kilometers. So let's say seven to nine miles across. Yeah. And that made a crater that was 200 kilometers across, roughly speaking, or about 300 miles across. We don't want it to happen again, but of course there's, no, a, that would be there's a tiny chance it might. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but a much bigger chance, sort of smaller, but still very nasty impact yeah, we would occur. Have a, a lot of those. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, that's a, a suitable note to end the lecture <laughs> on. <laughs> uh, let's Thank not hope we don't go the way of the dinosaurs. Uh, Thank you for coming. Don't forget our next event on the 2nd of November by the Science Fiction writer and astrophysicist Gregory Benford. And it's about big problems, big solutions. Thank you. <laughs>